go ahead and crank it up. All right, we're going to have Mike Anderson from Vernon High School, who's been doing first for how many years now, Mike? Uh, 14 years. All right, so he and I both start about the same time. And he, the last few years, has done a presentation both in person or remote on the RoboReal functionality and programming it. And we'd like to continue that because with the RoboReal being such an important part of your robots, uh, it's a critical piece of things to learn about. So, Mike, take it off. All right. Thanks, Don. I appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everybody. Glad you were able to make it. Uh, we will be talking about the uh, FRC 2324 control system, uh, the software, and what you have to do in order to get your robot up and running. Uh, it is, of course, the RoboRio uh, is the major piece of this puzzle. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the FRC, the basic FRC control system. We'll deal with uh, some sensors. We'll talk about absolute versus relative sensors. Uh, some of the things that you'll commonly hook up to your RoboRio, cameras, uh, limit position sensors, speed sensors, distance and directing sensors. Uh, we'll talk about how you interface to those sensors from the RoboRio, and then we'll uh, jump into how you install the RoboRio software, the development environment, and then we'll give you an example of what you have to do in order to build and deploy your first robot program. So we got a lot of stuff to talk about over the next uh, hour and a half or so. Uh, let's jump into it. Uh, we, of course, are focused on trying to get you to understand the basics of the FRC control system. And that means what do you have to do in order to get your robot running? Uh, we clearly can't explain everything in this particular presentation. We just don't have enough time. But... The advantage is if you have my uh, email address, which was on the front page there, uh, we back up there. So that's my email address. Uh, if you reach out to me at that email address, I'll be happy to try and answer any questions that you may have and uh, see what I can do about getting you some answers. Uh, now, we want you to understand how the RoboRio fits into the, the construction of your overall robot. Um, but in order for you to understand how the RoboRio works, we need to understand how control system works and how it's programmed. But hopefully you'll get enough out of this presentation that you'll be able to get something up and running pretty quickly. Now, here's the general 2023-24 uh, control system. Uh, it really hasn't changed all that much over the past couple of years. Uh, we have the RoboRio uh, the RoboRio here, this is a picture of RoboRio version 1. We'll talk about ver version 2 here in just a minute. Uh, we have digital IOs along this side. Uh, these are digital sensors. These are either on or off. This is typically where you'll see things like limit switches. We have the robot signal light. Uh, that's a requirement for use in the game. Uh, the robot signal light is used to indicate to the field management system uh, and the, the refs, whether or not your robot is still active, it blinks when your robot is active and goes solid when the robot's been disabled. Uh, we have relays. Uh, these relays are typically high power relays. You see the example here. Um, this particular relay is used to, to drive bigger motors or things that are more powerful than uh, you can use typically with the PWMs and other expansion units that we'll talk about in a moment. Um, these relays, uh, for instance, we have a, a t-shirt cannon robot that we built for Team 116. And uh, the compressor on the t-shirt cannon is way too big for the compressor. Uh, that we're using in uh, typical first applications. So in order for us to be able to use that, we actually take advantage of a relay and then uh, use it to switch higher power. Uh, we have analog inputs. We'll talk about what those are all about. We have uh, pulse width modulated si uh, uh, signals here, PWMs. These are typically used for uh, older style motor controllers. Um, we have uh, SPI, which is Serial Peripheral Interface. We'll talk more about that. We have Ethernet, USB. Uh, these are typically for Ethernet cameras and things of that. I mean, for uh, USB cameras. This is the USB interface that we typically use for programming the RoboRio. So this is what's called a USB-B connector. 
Um, typically used for interfacing to printers uh, is where you typically see this type of connector. Uh, so you de definitely need to keep one of those cables around if you need to program the Robo Rio, um, especially the first time we're trying to bring it up. And we'll go through that process here in a moment. Um, we see power, uh, power coming from the power distribution panel. Uh, this one happens to be the Crossroad Electronics PDP, but uh, we'll also show you the, uh, the new power distribution panel from Rev Robotics. Uh, we have CAN bus. This is the controller area network. Controller area network, if you have a car that was made since 1998, uh, you have CAN bus. CAN bus is an extremely popular interface it's used not only in automotive, it's also used in space applications. Uh, I use it on some of my uh, satellites that I work with for the U.S. Space Force. So uh, it's very popular interface, and we're seeing more and more of the first system switching over to CAN bus. Uh, certainly the pneumatics control module that we use for controlling the compressor and the pneumatics uh, pneumatic solenoids, things of that sort, that is all being done through, via CAN bus these days. Uh, whether you're using the Crossroad Electronics uh, PCM or you're using the Rev Robotics PCM, we'll show you both of those in a moment. Um, there, of course, is the voltage regulator module. And then we have remote to all of this is the operator console. So otherwise known as the operator interface or the OI. Uh, the operator interface is your joystick and, of course, a laptop that we then go to the field management system in order to talk to the Robo Rio, uh, typically via a wireless bridge of some sort, um, you know, usually a, 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 a Wi-Fi bridge. So that's the basics of what we would see in a control system. Of course, we have power coming in down here in the bottom. This is our standard uh, battery comes in to the 120 amp breaker. This 120 amp breaker then drives the entire system. Uh, so this is the big red power switch that you have to make sure that uh, you can get access to from outside of the robot. Um, and that'll be one of the things that you get from an inspection. They'll actually take a look to make sure that they can shut the power off in case your robot does a halt and catch fire operation. Um, and I have seen that happen. Uh, typically, uh, when you get aluminum shavings or something like that into a motor controller, uh, they will catch fire. Uh, that's, of course, not a normal sort of operation that we want to try and encourage. But uh, it does happen sometimes, so we need to be able to make sure that we can shut power off completely and then hit it with the uh, fire extinguishers if that happens. Uh, last time I saw that was down in uh, a competition at uh, in New Orleans, but uh, you know definitely it happens on occasion. All right, so here is Robo Rio version one. Uh, we have uh, we were just kind of doing that quick tour around the system here. We have the CAN bus interface. Uh, I squared C, that's the inter IC communications bus. Um, where I squared C comes into play, there are a lot of sensors that are available from companies like SparkFun and Adafruit uh, that all interface via I squared C. Uh, RS-232, uh, you will still see a few sensors that use RS-232, but that's not very common. Um, we also have the custom electronics port. This is called the MXP. Um, this is the Robo Rio expansion port. Uh, the Robo Rio expansion port, there is a device, there's actually a couple of devices that we'll take a look at that uh, take advantage of this particular port to add more control ports. Uh, serial peripheral interface, the SPI bus, uh, this is the other interface that we'll see a lot of sensors on. So uh, this, of course, we also have the reset button down here and user button, which can be used to do resets for, uh, you know, you program it basically so that you can then determine uh, if I press the user button, it resets the gyros or something like that would be a typical type of application. <laughs> You'll also notice here, that there's an accelerometer built into the Robo Rio. We'll talk more about what the accelerometer is and what it does in a few charts. So that's Robo Rio version one. Robo Rio version two looks very similar. Uh, they've changed a couple of things. Uh, one thing is they've added this SD card slot. Um, the advantage of the SD card slot is, first of all, you can boot from the SD card slot. 
Um, and you can put your application, uh, your actual robot application on the SD card slot. The other advantage of the SD card slot is that it gives you the ability to store additional logs. So uh, when you're doing your initial setup and debug of your applications, especially if you happen to be trying to use something complicated like Swerve Drive, there are oftentimes a lot of logging information, a lot of messages that you want to actually try and save so that you can then come back and take a look at it and see why your Swerve Drive is doing weird stuff. So uh, having access to this SD card slot means that you've got access to a lot more storage that you can then write those logs off to and then pull it out and read them off of the RoboRio later. Uh, we have, of course, the uh, digital IOs. We talked about those, the relays, et cetera, et cetera. All this is pretty much uh, the same as RoboRio version 1. What's important about RoboRio version 2 is what's on the inside. Now, and that's the key thing. So version 2 adds that SD card slot. Uh, it does have an option for a gold copy. Um, which means that you can actually take advantage of that user button and restore your code uh, in about 23 seconds. So if you happen to be uh, in a situation where your software team has decided to upload a piece of code uh, in the pits, uh, they haven't had a chance to test it, and it looks really, really bad, <laughs> sometimes things go wrong, uh, so you can then restore back to your gold copy in about 23 seconds so that you can get back out on the field. Uh, that's an important feature uh, just from a safety perspective and, of course, being able to keep your robot running. Um, the version 2 now has a lower brownout voltage. A ver version 1 would start to brown out when you, your batteries got down to about 7 volts. Uh, remember, your battery system in uh, first is a 12-volt system. In the case of version two, they have improved the brownout voltage down to about four and a half volts. Uh, so that's good if you happen to be uh, if you happen to be using a battery that you forgot to charge uh, and didn't check it check it out with your battery beak, then uh, it will be a little bit more tolerant at uh, brownouts. The processor in version two jumps from a 666 megahertz dual core to an 866 megahertz dual core. Um, that is a 32-bit processor. It is not a 64-bit processor. Uh, not that that matters for us in first, but uh, it is just a, a piece of note for folks who are interested in that kind of thing. Uh, so it is uh, about 30% well, faster uh, than the previous version of the RoboRio, so that's a good thing. RAM has doubled to 512 megabytes of RAM versus 256 in the version one. Um, again, where that starts to come into play is in some of the things that we're doing nowadays for uh, the use of AI and ML, that is uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning. So uh, the AI ML uh, applications typically tend to eat a lot of memory. So having access to additional memory is a good thing. Uh, there is 16 megabytes of storage on the field programmable gate array. Um, inside of the RoboRio, we have a lot of counters uh, and things of that sort that are implemented in the FPGA. Um, you can think of an FPGA as software implemented in hardware. Uh, so with the FPGA, you can program special features inside of the unit. Um, they don't give us access to the FPGA. That FPGA is pre-programmed for us when it comes from National Instruments. But uh, the fact that they've got additional storage on the FPGA and it comes with a four gigabit, uh, four gigabyte rather, micro SD card, uh, that's a significant improvement over what we had in the version one. The version one had 256 megabytes of storage. Uh, and an embedded multimedia card storage, EMMC. Both version 1 and version 2 will be legal for the foreseeable future. Uh, version 2 will be in the rookie kit of parts. So if you are a rookie team, you will be able to get that. It'll come in your kit of parts. Otherwise, you can go out to Andy Mark and pick up a copy of the uh, RoboRio 2 for about, three, about $485. 
uh, it is not a cheap part by any stretch. Um, and National Instruments has done a lot of work to try and keep it uh, from being shorted out. Uh, you know, if you inadvertently uh, plug the positive into the negative versus, uh, you know, that kind of thing. Um, it's a fairly resilient device, but it is still pretty expensive. Uh, I mean, that's that's pretty expensive for a 32-bit uh, a processor that is of this particular class. Nonetheless, it's a pretty solid unit. Um, we have not had, I mean, in all the years that uh, 116 has been using the Roborios, I think we may have killed one of them, um, and I'm not quite sure why that was done, but it, it could have also been just a, a premature failure on the part. So some significant differences between version one and version two. If you have the choice, I would definitely use version two, uh, but uh, it's often you've got old version ones that are sitting around that you can use for practice robots. Uh, there's really not a whole lot of things that we typically do with FIRST uh, that are not related to AI ML kind of applications that would require the version 2. Uh, it's just nice to have the additional speed out there just in case. There's some new parts from Rev Robotics. Uh, this is the new Rev um, power distribution module. Uh, the nice thing about this power distribution module is that all of the devices, all of the power devices here, uh, are capable of doing 40 amps. So that's a significant improvement over what the cross-the-road electronics interface looks like. Um, the interfaces, the mechanical interfaces are a little bit easier to work with here. Uh, you actually have a little pa uh, paddle that you flip up that allows you to then plug the wire in and then flip it down. Uh, so it's a little e easier to work with than the, uh, the Wigand uh, connectors that we used to have on the Crossroad Electronics devices. Um, we still have some of those still uh, those types of connectors here for um, the power to the Roborio, the power to the um, Cross the road. I mean, excuse me, to the um, pneumatics control module, and of course to the voltage regulator modules. Uh, this red, this yellow and green that you see down here, this is CAN bus, and that's a fairly consistent color coding that they have for CAN bus within first uh, all the FRC stuff. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about CAN bus a little later. But uh, you then have the option of terminating the CAN bus here. And the, typically, the end of the power distribution module is the termination, whereas the Robo Rio is the other end of the termination. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit more about CAN bus in a bit. Uh, pneumatics control module. Uh, again, we have CAN bus interface to the PCM. Uh, the PCM from REV has an advantage that it is able to handle 16 uh, devices instead of eight, which is what we used to have with the uh, Crossroad Electronics PCM. Uh, we do have interfaces to the uh, the compressor as well. So all that is pretty much the same. Uh, the advantage, of course, is that uh, you do have 16 uh, interfaces here instead of just eight. Um, this power over Ethernet injector, um, this goes between the uh, hub, so we power the power over Ethernet. This then powers up um, the uh, radio, so this is our Wi-Fi interface here, and the radio has the advantage of being able to be powered over this Ethernet cable. The advantage there is that it is much more reliable to take advantage of the RJ45 connector on the Ethernet cable than it is to use a separate power jack. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times uh, we've been in competition, got hit by another robot, and it jiggled the uh, power jack loose on our modem, and our robot was dead on the field. So being able to take advantage of this power over Ethernet injector and then uh, having one end go to the Roborio, the other end go to the modem, and then have power going to the modem over this connector that has a little locking mechanism in it, uh, that's a huge advantage. So if you can take advantage of the power over Ethernet ejector, injector, I highly recommend doing that. It will make for a much more reliable connection to your modem. 
All right, so let's talk a little bit about how we take advantage of the Robo Rio. Uh, first of all, sensors. Now, when we think about a sensor, what is a sensor? It's a device that's used to measure some sort of quantity. Now, the measurements can either be absolute, that is, we want to turn to uh, 90 degrees, or we want to spin the shooter wheel up to 3,500 RPM. Um, those are absolute numbers. We know exactly what 90 degrees is or what east is. We know exactly what 3,500 RPMs is. Um, so that's an absolute measurement. A relative measurement would be whatever direction you're facing, turn 180 degrees from that right now. Um, so that would be a relative measurement. You're, you're turning 180 degrees. That's an absolute, but it's relative to where you are right now. Um, or we want to spin the shooter wheel 25% um, uh, faster. Uh, so that is something that's going to be relative to how fast you're moving right now. So whether you use absolute or relative measurements depends on the application. And we'll see examples of that as we go through the presentation here. So now, why would we use sensors in the first place? And the answer is real simple. Your drive team's got a lot of stuff happening. They're watching the field. They're watching other robots. They are watching for game pieces. All of that is a lot of work. And complex robots can be really difficult for anybody to manage, especially um, with all the other things that are happening out on the field. So we can use sensors to take the burden off the drive team and allow them to do what they're there to do, that is to drive. Um, we'll move it to the hardware, we'll take advantage of software, and that allows us to offload the drive, the drive team from all of the management of the robot. Now, getting the right sensors can make the robot really simple to control during the game. Um, recent games have even had lots of obstacles on the field, so you couldn't see the robot on the opposite side of the field. Um, certainly the one that we had that was the steampunk game, there was a huge tower in the way, so you couldn't see what the robot was doing on the other side of the field. So it's really important to take advantage of sensors in order to enable the drive team to, to actually play the game. So one of the first sensors I would add to any robot is a simple camera. Now, whether you're using a USB camera or an IP camera, um, we, we in just two lines of code, we can get a camera feed coming back to the driver station. In more sophisticated applications, the camera can actually do target recognition, uh, auto-targeting, color detection, <clears throat> there's a whole bunch of things that can be done with these cameras. And, uh, of course, we're starting to see more uh, artificial intelligence being enabled on the cameras. Uh, so that's a, a really good thing. We can actually almost put the robot into automatic mode and allow it to search for targets or to find uh, game pieces on the field. So there are a lot of things that we can do with cameras. And, and in this particular case, uh, what we see up here in the upper uh, right-hand corner, uh, this was from the Frisbee game. Uh, I had, think that was 2012. Um, and in the Frisbee game, we have uh, what they refer to as retroreflective tape. So retroreflective tape, when you shine a light on that tape, it reflects back in the direction that the light came from. So you see this on stoplights, uh, I mean, stop signs and uh, usual traffic signs. But the advantage of retroreflective tape is that if I have, uh, say, a blue light coming from the robot, then every place that that retroreflective tape is located will then glow blue. Um, similar sort of thing for green or red or whatever color you want to use. And the advantage of that is that your camera can then be set up to look for the color blue or green or red and use that as a way of being able to do target recognition. And once you have that ability to do target recognition, then that 
helps the drive team by simply being able to say, okay, point the robot in this general direction, push a button, and then it looks for a target. And then once it finds the target, then it can start shooting uh, whatever the game piece is. So that's a huge win. And uh, there is very little uh, reason why I would not have a camera on every single robot. And of course, the RoboRio makes it fairly easy to interface cameras, uh, both in the hardware and software uh, side. Uh, limit switches. Now, limit switches typically come in via the digital input, the DIOs. Uh, limit switches are there largely to indicate uh, you've hit a maximum or a minimum. So like you've got an arm that's reaching up and you want it to stop before it breaks the arm. So having a limit switch that just simply makes contact with the arm when it gets to a certain position that's a huge uh, capability there that is easy to implement on the Robo Rio and very easy for your software team to implement as well. Uh, there are also sensors that are what they call analog sensors. So this is a digital sensor. It's either on or off. Um, you have ones like uh, potentiometers. These are analog sensors. So what happens here is I have power coming in. I have power going out, so this is a positive and negative. And then I have this thing called the wiper. And the wiper is a little arm that then makes contact with this thing in red here. This is a rotating dial. And voltage will change based on the position of the rotary sensor that's right here in the middle. So as this thing turns, this little wiper goes back and forth and that has the advantage of being able to then change the voltage that's coming out of here. So that if, for instance, I am, uh, if the wiper is right here at quarter way, then the voltage will be one quarter of the full voltage. So if the full voltage is five volts, then it'll be one quarter of five volts. If it is at the halfway mark, it'll be 2.5 volts. So we can then have an idea of the angle of an arm, for instance, a robot arm, uh, based on the location of this potentiometer. And there are several different versions of these things that are available electronically. There's even from Andy Mark, there's something called a string potentiometer. Um, that uh, when the string plays out, it, it rotates the potentiometer. Uh, it's kind of cool, and uh, we at 116 have used string potentiometers several times on our robots. Definitely uh, worth taking a look at. But that's an analog input, and there is, on the Robo Rio, there's an analog in section of the Robo Rio that's used for that kind of application. Uh, another type of sensor that we'll often find, uh, these are what they call Hall effect sensors. Um, these are found in uh, many cases in uh, uh, control, excuse me, um, uh, in your automobile when you have uh, cruise control. So as these things spin, there's a little gap in here that is detected by the sensor every single time it spins past. This is typically used for things like uh, tachometers, where we're trying to figure out how fast the shooter is spinning. We'll attach one of these Hall effect sensors to it, and it'll be able to tell us exactly how fast the, the uh, shooter is spinning before we let the, the game piece fall into the shooter. There are also things called shaft encoders. Uh, now, these are often referred to as quad shaft encoders, and that's because they take advantage of this quadrature feature. Uh, so they have two channels, an A channel and a B channel. If the A channel leads the B channel, then we're going forward. If it trails the B channel, we're going backwards. Fortunately, you don't have to worry about that in software. Uh, you can... It, because it has a counter that's associated with it. So if the counter is going up, we're going forward. If it's going down, we're going backwards. So you'll typically find these sorts of encoders. Uh, the advantage of these encoders is they will have a pulse count per revolution. So let's say we have 360 pulses per revolution. That means one revolution of the motor is 360 pulses, which means it's one degree per pulse. 
if we know, for instance, that it takes, say, 10 pulses per revolution and our wheel is six inches in diameter, then we can calculate how far the robot has moved in a one complete revolution of the motor. So this is useful for being able to keep track of where your robot is on the field and how far it's gone. Now, you'll typically find these encoders in modern brushless motors. Uh, so the Rev Robotics Spark Max, uh, the Vex Pro Falcon 500, um, all of these have got shaft encoders built into them. That is tremendous, a huge help in being able to know exactly where your robot is and be able to do things like turn uh, and, and move at the same time. Uh, that's really important for things like um, the uh, the new drive systems, the new drive wheel systems. So um, certainly all of that is important to kind of come together. And again, the Robo Rio helps you take advantage of all these things by forcing that kind of control out to the motor controllers. And then we can just simply ask the motor controller how far it's moved. Distance sensors, another thing that we'll commonly find in FIRST. Uh, distance sensors all pretty much work the same way. They send a pulse out, and then they measure how much time it takes for the pulse to return. There's then typically a formula that's used to convert time into distance. Uh, that's often done inside of the sensor itself, so you don't really have to do that. You just simply read from the sensor the distance that the object is away from. Now, um, a lot of distance sensors here, they will either use infrared light. Uh, they can also use ultrasonic, so they can use uh, sound waves. Um, these are all first legal. Uh, there are also laser radars or LIDARs that are FRC legal, as long as you're using a class one laser. And most of the class, most of the laser ranging systems that you find on uh, first, excuse me, on uh, like uh, SparkFun and Adafruit are all class one lasers. The thing that you have to be aware of is that not all of these distance sensors are created equal. Some can have a range of up to 30 feet, uh, others only a few inches. So you have to pick the right sensor for the application that you're trying to do. And some of them like the lasers, they are not very accurate close in. So if you only have a few inches that you're trying to measure, the laser is not very accurate for that kind of range, but it's very accurate at 20, 30 feet. So you might wanna take advantage of some of these other modalities, depending on the distance that you're trying to figure out how far away you are. So here is the Max Botics ultrasonic sensor. Um, it has a, uh, and if you hold it up to your ear, you'll actually hear it clicking. Uh, that's because it's sending a pulse out and then expecting a pulse back. Uh, we have infrared. Uh, these are uh, classic kind of sensors. These are very short range, typically for infrared sensors. They may get out to 80 centimeters at a maximum. Um, so these are not very long range. Uh, ultrasonics can be out to 20, 30 feet sometimes. Um, here we see what they refer to as a ping sensor. Uh, this is ultra, also an ultrasonic, but it has one transmitter and one receiver. The advantage of having two of them like this is that you get better resolution out of it. Um, so you'll be able to determine how far away something is with a little bit better accuracy than you have with a single unit like this uh, Maxbotics ultrasonic. Um, this is an example of a laser-based rangefinder on a servo. So in this case, the rangefinder moves, sweeps back and forth like this, and we have a transmitter that has the laser inside of it and a receiver where the light bounces back. Now, the disadvantage of laser-based rangefinders is that they are too accurate in many cases. Um, if, for instance, uh, it is very good at measuring a point source, that is, if you are looking to find out how far away uh, a ball is or a game piece, it's very good at that. 
but if you're pointing at something that has holes in it, then the laser rangefinder is so accurate that it will actually not bounce off of the frame, but actually bounce off of what's on the other side of the hole. So it can give you um, kind of false readings. Uh, we had that happen in the stronghold game where uh, the um, uh, kind of the, uh, the, the end game piece, kind of it was a tower, and the tower had uh, a doorway in it. And when we used the rangefinder with the laser, it was measuring the backside of the tower through the doorway rather than the distance to the tower. So it would throw our uh, shooter range off by about three feet. Um, so definitely you want to take advantage of things like distance sensors, but understand that some distance sensors are better than others uh, for certain applications. In general, I would use an ultrasonic uh, because it usually has a much wider beam. Um, but lasers can be great if you need to get an absolute distance to a specific target. Now, <clears throat> direction sensors. In order to figure out what angle your robot is at, the direction of your robot, then there are a number of possibilities. We have gyroscopes, we have magnetometers, we have accelerometers. A gyroscope measures the rate of turn. Now, uh, that's an acceleration. WPI Lib, which is the software that runs on the Rover Rios, has an integrated function inside of it to determine the angle of the robot relative to its starting direction. So again, this is a relative movement. If I start the robot for, uh, facing north, and I use a gyroscope, then I can tell when I've moved from north to west, for instance, by measuring the rate of that turn. But the problem with gyroscopes is that they will drift over time, especially if they get hit by another robot. So, and, and or if you run your robot into a wall, uh, which of course happens all the time in first. So <clears throat> as a consequence, uh, gyroscopes will oftentimes need to be reset. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. A uh, magnetometer is also known as a digital compass. Uh, <clears throat> and because it's a compass, it's, in, it's affected by magnetic fields. Well, guess what? Your motor is a great big magnetic field. <clears throat> so if you have your sensor too close to your motors, then the sensor will be confused by the motors and not give you a true measurement. So magnetometers, although oftentimes we'll find inertial measurement units, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, that have a magnetometer in them, will rarely use the digital compass simply because it's too easy for it to get confused with big pieces of metal and big magnetic fields like we have with the big motors. Uh, now, how would we go about measuring whether we're level or not? Uh, well, that's just known as an accelerometer, and an accelerometer measures acceleration. Uh, it typically measures the acceleration of gravity. So this accelerometer is measuring in terms of 1G. So 1G is normal gravity at sea level. Um, that's the 9.32 meters per second squared or whatever uh, that you get with the acceleration of gravity. Uh, it can be used to detect things like tilt. So, for instance, here in uh, 2012, we had the rebound rumble game. Um, this had a teeter-totter on it. And at the end of the game, we were trying to make sure that our robots balanced the teeter-totter. And they would roll back and forth trying to get the teeter-totter level. Well, the students, if they were trying to drive that, if this was part of the drive team and they were trying to adjust it manually, then that was very difficult because the amount of time that it took, there was a delay between when they moved the joystick and when the robot actually moved. And that's because of the field management system. So if we had an accelerometer, we could then turn the robot on automatic 
and it would then automatically adjust itself to make this uh, teeter-totter level. So there is a three-axis accelerometer that's built into the Robo Rio. Um, with the ac accelerometer, we have things like right and left, forward and back, up and down, uh, roll and yaw, uh, so uh, pitch and yaw. So all of these are uh, available to us in the accelerometer, depending on the number of um, uh, degrees of freedom that the accelerometer has. So a typical accelerometer will have three axes. Uh, so a three degree of freedom accelerometer, so that can then measure uh, left and right, up and down, and roll. So roll, pitch, and yaw is uh, how they refer to it. If we take a gyroscope, an accelerometer, and a magnetometer, and we combine them all together, we end up with something called an inertial measurement unit. Uh, this allows you to know where your robot is in the physical world and allows for very precise navigation. If you've ever used drones, uh, if you've ever flown drones that then know how to navigate themselves, um, this is typically how they do it, <clears throat> is through this inertial measurement unit. Now, uh, that uh, expansion connector on the Robo Rio, the MXP connector, uh, this is where you'll take something like this device from Kawhi Labs. This is called a Navex. It plugs into the Robo Rio, and then it adds additional capabilities for being able to measure uh, roll, pitch, and yaw, and um, gyroscopes and things of that sort. So... This typically is going to be what's referred to as a nine degree of freedom. It has XYZ gyroscope, XYZ magnetometer, and XYZ accelerometer. So that's nine degrees of freedom that this particular sensor can measure. The other advantage of something like the Navex is that it adds additional I.O. So it's got additional uh, digital I.O.s, analog I.O.s. Uh, so it has expansion. If you have a really sophisticated robot and a lot of sensors, then it turns out that the Robo Rio, you may in fact run out of connections on the Robo Rio. This is one way of being able to address that. Uh, there is another type of inertial measurement unit that is now connected via CAN bus, uh, and that's called the Pigeon and the Pigeon 2. Those are from Crossroad Electronics. Um, the advantage of the CAN bus is that you can then place the sensor in the center of your robot in a flat orientation. When we're building our robots, oftentimes our Roborio may be at a weird angle. So it may be canted in some way. Uh, you know, we may have it on a board. Uh, we may have it vertical. We may have it horizontal. It may be upside down. So... If our sensor is attached to the Robo Rio, then our sensor, our software team has to know that the sensor is in a weird kind of orientation. And then they can, in software, figure out uh, how to adjust for that. But if we have a, uh, a device like the Pigeon, which is a uh, CAN bus based device, it has wires that run to it and you can then place the pigeon anywhere on the robot in any orientation you want so that you then have, um, you know, an absolute orientation to the device. Uh, that's a real advantage. And we've used uh, the CAN bus based pigeons on the last couple of robots that we've built uh, for the last couple of seasons at 116. All right. So what we're talking about here when we're dealing with motor controllers is there are motor controllers that have sensor inputs. Uh, the Cross the Road Electronics, the, the Talon, uh, the Spark Max, uh, we have uh, those motor controllers have a little, uh, con a little control port built into them. This is called a Gadgeteer port. Um, and this port has options for inputting, uh, for instance, limit switches. Now, one of the things we do in FIRST, we often will have an arm that will be raising up. We want to make sure that we don't put too much power into the arm and break the arm control. So 
what we'll do is we'll put a limit switch on the arm so that when the arm gets to a specific location, it automatically stops. Well, we could do that through the Robo Rio. We could wire the sensor all the way back to the digital IOs in the Robo Rio. However, it turns out that the motor controllers automatically have this capability. And we can then hook up the forward limit switch and reverse limit switch to the motor controller and we'll, refer, we'll do something that we refer to as closing the loop. Closing the loop says there's a little microcontroller, a little computer that's inside of the motor controller. And that little microcontroller has the ability to detect when we've reached the forward or reverse limit switches. We also have inputs for quad shaft encoders. We also have inputs for an analog input. So we have that potentiometer that we could use to measure the angle of the uh, shooting arm, for instance. So all of these things come into the motor controller and the software team can then tell the motor controller to automatically stop when the limit switch is hit, or it can be programmed to move a specific distance and then stop. So that's a really important capability. Again, it takes load off of the drive team and pushes it onto the hardware controls and the software controls people. But those are things you get an opportunity to work out before you get onto the field. So we want to be able to take as much of the effort of driving the robot and controlling the robot off of the drive team as possible to keep them from being overloaded in the heat of competition. All right, so how do you interface to all these sensors we've been talking about? Well, it turns out that the WPI lib, which is the software that we use on the RoboRio, um, has a collection of interface supports for serial and I squared C and SPI, digital IO, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, when you select a sensor, you need to know what kind of interface it requires. So if you go out to sparkfun.com and you look up a uh, gyroscope, then you'll need to see whether the gyroscope is a spy bus interface or an I squared C interface. You need to know what kind of interface it has to make sure that you have a connection on the Robo Rio that will support that. Uh, you may have to add auxiliary interfaces like the Navex from Kawhi Labs to the robot uh, in order to have all the connections that you're interested in. You also have to make sure that you have power and ground returns for the sensors. So you have not only the sensor wire, but you also have power and ground that have to be um, uh, it wired up as well. So that says for each sensor, you'll typically have a minimum of three wires, power, ground, and the actual sensor wire itself. In the case of a limit switch, you only need two because the power comes from the Roborio, goes to the limit switch, and then comes back from the limit switch. So depending on the type of sensor you're using, you may have to have either two or three wires for every sensor. Also, you have to understand what kind of power the sensor needs. The Robo Rio is a 3.3 volt system. It is five volt tolerant, which means if you have sensors that are either 3.3 volt or five volt, they will work with the Robo Rio. But the Robo Rio itself, is a 3.3 volt system. So, especially the Robo Rio 2. So when you're wiring in sensors, you need to understand how much voltage do they need? Typically, it's not going to be a current problem. Most of these sensors are very low current, but they do have specific requirements for voltage. And you just need to make sure that you provide enough power to the device so that the sensor functions correctly. All right. so. That's kind of the hardware piece of what we have to do with the Robo Rio. Now we're going to switch over and talk a little bit about the software piece. Um, there is a technical resource page uh, that goes through all the installation steps. So you'll see if you just uh, type into Google uh, or whatever your favorite browser is, um, installing FRC game tools. And it will take you to the link in the first website that allows you to then click on that link and it'll go through the instructions for you. Typically, it's best if you uninstall previous versions 
So if you have a laptop that you used last year and it has last year's game tools on it, your best bet is to uninstall last year's game tools and then install the new ones. Uh, that way it makes sure that everything is nice and clean and you don't get any confusion in the software. It'll take about 20 minutes to uninstall, uh, or to, excuse me, to install the new version. If you need to uninstall the old version first, then that's going to add additional time. And uh, it is dependent. When you get ready to do the installation, you have to have a good connection to the Internet. So if you are uh, – Using the high, you know, using the school's internet connection, it might take longer than if you were using your interconnection uh, internet connection at home, for instance. Uh, this, uh, when you install the FRC game tools, it also installs the driver station application, and it installs the RoboRio imaging tool with the latest image release. So, in order for you to get the RoboRio up to the right version you need to make sure you've installed all of this software. Now we have a question. Uh, oh, okay. So we've got somebody sitting in the waiting room. So Steve or uh, Don, if you could let them in, that'd be great. Um, once we install the software for the driver station and the RoboRio imaging tool, then we're going to have to image the RoboRio. So if you have use this RoboRio in the past, or if it's a brand new RoboRio, um, there is very little chance that it's going to have the right version of the software on it. So you're going to have to update everything. And first is very diligent about making sure that the WPI lib and the RoboRio version number has to match. So if you have an old RoboRio and you haven't updated it recently, you're going to have to update it. So how do you go about updating it? Well, uh, just real quick, this is what the driver station looks like if you've never seen it before. Um, we have the enable button here. This will allow us to enable the robot. Uh, we have, have teleoperated mode. We have autonomous mode, practice mode, and then we have test interfaces for the software team. Um, we can bring the camera back to the area up here. So this will display the camera. Um, we have a gyroscope uh, input. We have joystick inputs, things of that sort. So we can kind of see what the robot is doing at any one point in time. And if there's any error messages that come from the robot during execution, then we'll see them show up here in this little window. Um, this is the typical driver station. Uh, we won't spend any more time on that because that's really not germane to the RoboRio. That's the controller for the RoboRio from the user interface. The RoboRio, uh, there's a few things to know about the RoboRio. Uh, it runs Linux. Uh, there is a secure shell server inside of the RoboRio. And what happens when we get ready to deploy software to the RoboRio, it actually uses a secure copy program, a SCP. So it will copy the application over onto the RoboRio using an encrypted link. Um, Addressing the RoboRio, it's when you do your uh, installation of the RoboRio software, you'll tell it what your team number is. And it will always show up as RoboRio dash team number. So say 1418 dash FRC dot local. That will be how you find the RoboRio. You can find it by name. Now, what I recommend you do is you hard code the IP address of the RoboRio into it using the website. So inside of the RoboRio, once the software is installed, there's a small little web server that runs in the RoboRio itself. You can actually go to that RoboRio's web server and then force it to a specific IP address. A uh, couple of other things. Uh, we'll, we'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, don't delete the RoboRio admin account or change its password. That's required in order for you to load your programs to the robot. You will not be hooking your robot up to the internet with a capital I. So that should never be a circumstance that you would run into. So don't ever hook your robot 
up to the internet and try to control it over the internet. Um, and that's because it does have some security weaknesses that is not the environment it's made for. So you definitely do not want some hacker to take your robot over and start doing bad things with it. So definitely don't do that. Um, so that's useful information. And for those of you who may be interested, there is uh, the Linux that's ver that it's running here is a real-time enhanced version of Linux that comes from National Instruments. So this is an actual version of Linux that has been optimized for use in the robot. So that's a, a, a great thing. Uh, definitely take advantage of that. Um, you know, fortunately, you don't really have to worry too much about that. But the nice thing is that it has been optimized for use in the robot. All right, so there are several programming environments that are available for the RoboRio. We have LabVIEW, Java, and C and C++. There is a version of Python that runs on the RoboRio. It's not officially supported by FIRST. If you want to take advantage of Python, then I would reach out to the folks at 1418. Uh, they probably have more experience with running Python on the robot uh, of, of any team that I know of in the area. LabVIEW is kind of a software through pictures kind of approach. Um, it's found in a limited environment for test equipment around the world. Most of the FRC teams will write their software in either Java or C and C++. Java has the advantage that it's the same language that's required by the computer science AP test. C and C++ has an advantage that it's faster than Java um, in terms of execution time. Um, but it is um, very similar to Java. If you're used to reading Java, you can read C and C++ and vice versa. Java was originally designed, it was developed as, a, as an offshoot of C++. So Java and C++ have now kind of split, but um, they were both based on the same language back in the day. So the development environment from first is using uh, Microsoft Visual Studio Code. Uh, it's available for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. There is support from uh, WPI Lib for Linux and for uh, Windows. I don't remember about Mac OS. I don't have a Mac, uh, but uh, there's definitely a version of the Visual Studio Code tool that runs in Mac OS. Um, and as far as Mac OS is concerned, I know that there are ARM-based Macs and x86-based Macs. I don't know. Uh, I have not seen the latest release. They have not put the latest release out yet. So uh, whether WPI Lib will support both the x86 Macs and the ARM-based Macs, I don't know yet. Uh, hopefully it will, but we'll see when they finally release the code uh, at kickoff. The compiler is an open source compiler called GCC, the GNU Compiler Collection. It does support the latest C++ 17 extensions. Um, the C compiler is actually what they call a cross compiler. It runs on the x86 and targets the ARM-based uh, platform that's sitting over in the RoboRio. Uh, for those of you who don't know what ARM is, that's basically the processor that's in your cell phone. So your uh, the RoboRio is, for all intents and purposes, an old cell phone in the way that it operates. For Java, the build system uh, will use OpenJDK, which is the Java development kit, and that will produce Java bytecode. Java bytecode is uh, platform independent. So uh, Java will work regardless of whether you're x86 or ARM, um, whereas the C compiler requires you to know what kind of processor you're running on. So how do we load firmware to the RoboRio? When you first get your RoboRio, it will be out of date. There's no question about that. If you're using an older RoboRio that was used last year, it will also be out of date, so you'll have to update it. Um, the RoboRio imaging tool, if you click on that, that should be automatically installed on your platform when you install the FRC game tools. It will then pop up this uh, interface, this interface works with the RoboRio version 1. The RoboRio version 2 uses a different way of updating the firmware. So the RoboRio version 2 uses Belena Etcher, which is the same tool that is used for the Raspberry Pi. 
So in this particular case, if you're using the Robo Rio version two, there's an option in this to copy the firmware image off to uh, another file so that you can then load it using uh, Belena Etcher or one of the USB programming tools that programs the USB, um, the SD card that goes into the Robo Rio version two. So it's a little bit different between Robo Rio version one and Robo Rio version two. Um, they may have fixed that with the latest release, um, but as of the one that they have on the website today, it still uh, requires you to use a different programming interface for uh, version two version, versus version one of the Robo Rio. But the idea here is we'll find it, We'll specify our team number. We want it to format the target. This is the image that we want to load, whatever image is the current one. And then you'll click reformat. And it will then take about five to 10 minutes, depending on whether you're using a version one or a version two. But it will take a little while for it to program the firmware. Uh, once it's done, it will come back and tell you that it's completed and you'll have the latest version of the software on the Robo Rio. Now, uh, that's the Robo Rio side of it. We also need to make sure that we have our application software put together. So that's WPI Lib, and WPI Lib has to be downloaded. Um, you go out to the first website and you look up install WPI Lib, and it will take you to a link that allows you to download the WPI Lib tools. Now, the WPI Lib tools comes as an, an ISO interface. So this is looks like an old CD-ROM. It doesn't require a CD-ROM drive. You can just go ahead and mount it. So if you double click it, it'll automatically mount in Windows. A uh, similar sort of thing in the Mac, and you can also mount it in Linux as well. Um, it will, uh, take a while to download this image. So it's like 2.6 gigabytes. So it's a fairly big image. So you definitely want to have a high speed connection to the internet in order to download this. Um, we'll take a look at the Windows installation, but there are similar install steps for both Mac OS and Linux. And those are all called out on the first website. So we see here, uh, this was an older version. This was the 2020 version. But we double click on it, it then opens it up. We can tell it to uh, install. There's an installation of Visual Studio Code that comes along with it. Uh, so one step in the WPI Lib installation will ask if you want to install Visual Studio Code. The answer is yes, you do if you're using Java or C and C++. The installation will take about 10 minutes. It'll automatically install the compiler. It'll automatically install all the Java development kit. It'll adjust all the run paths. Everything will be set up for you once it finishes the installation. Now, if you're uh, using the Falcon 500 motors or you're using Rev Robotics uh, motor interfaces or the Rev Neos or the Neo 2s, uh, all of those motor controllers require vendor specific libraries. So you'll have to go out to Crossroad Electronics or you'll go out to Rev. You'll download their individual, either the Phoenix software for Crossroad Electronics or the Rev hardware uh, interface for Rev. You download those, you install those libraries separately and they will automatically install themselves into WPI Lib. So you want to in install WPI Lib first then install the vendor specific libraries. Once you, and I'll show you the, the process here. So we see the WPI lib installer, it comes up and says, oh, I wanna install, what do I wanna do? Uh, C++, Java, just basically leave these things checked. Download Visual Studio Code. Um, this, if you click on this, you'll select it so that it will automatically download the latest version of the uh, code editor from Microsoft and install it. You typically want to do that. Uh, even if you have an older version of Visual Studio Code installed, go ahead and install the latest version. You want to install the tools, the utilities, and the WPI lib uh, dependencies. You click the execute install, it'll automatically download. 
And then once it's downloaded and everything's all set up, you're basically ready to go execute the install and it'll go through the process of installing it. Once it's installed, you run the Visual Studio code. So there'll be a little icon that will show up. You double click on that. It'll then run Visual Studio code. And Visual Studio code, you'll see that WPI lib is one of the extensions that's listed here. Uh, you can add other extensions like Git, uh, which is a source control manager. I highly recommend that you do that. But um, that's a different discussion. That's a completely different presentation on how you install all of the software. But now we've got WPI lib installed and we can go about creating a project. So we can tell it to create a project. So we click on the little icon over here in the upper right hand corner. It'll bring up WPI lib, create a new project. When we create a new project, we'll specify what we're looking for. In this case, we were doing an example using C++ of arcade drive. And these are all buttons. So you push the button and it gives you a little menu as to what it is you're trying to install. We're installing this into a project folder. So just create a folder, um, you know, like call it FRC 2024 or something like that. Uh, we will give it a project name and we have to specify our team number and then we'll click generate project. When it generates the project, this is the kind of thing we'll see. Uh, this is in C++. I'll show you an example in Java in a moment. So th this is all of the stuff that we had to have to run this particular application. Uh, this one does not use any of the Crossroad Electronics, the Falcon 500 or the Rev Robotics stuff. This is using older PWM software, um, but that's a very simple example of a drive. And you'll notice here that it automatically builds. Uh, we have an option, if we go back up here, we'll see it has an option that says build robot code. That's what we'll typically do when we make software changes. So we'll make software changes, we'll save the software, we'll then uh, save the changes, and then we'll tell it to build the robot code. And if everything works, we should see this, build successful. If we get build failed, then something went wrong and we can look in the problems to see what went wrong. So that's a, a fairly straightforward process for building. And then when we're ready, uh, we would then go about, uh, so here's the build. And then we can actually deploy the robot code as well. So here's the option to deploy robot code. That will then automatically build it and then copy it over to the RoboRio. So you have to have the RoboRio powered up and it has to be connected to your build system either via uh, Ethernet or USB or Wi-Fi. So it has to be connected in some way in order for it to actually download uh, to the target board. Now, uh, what if we wanted to add support for, let's say, the Rev Robotics or the Crossroad Electronics motor controllers? The way we do that is we click on that little red W in the editor and it has an option here that says manage vendor libraries. When we go to uh, manage vendor libraries, we've installed the vendor libraries. We went out to Rev Robotics, for instance, and downloaded the hardware client. We then tell it to install new libraries offline and it will then put all of the, it'll present all of the libraries that have been installed. So you just simply check the library that you want or libraries, you can add all of them if you'd like, that's no problem doing that. They're not mutually exclusive. And once you've checked all the libraries, click okay. And then that will copy the libraries into the directory where your software is being developed. So now you've got access to all the APIs associated with those new devices. So once the library is installed in your project, you can start using it. You will need to make sure you've got the header files, uh, either the pound includes if you're using C and C++ or the imports if you're using Java. Uh, once you're built and you get that build successful, then you can basically deploy it to uh, the robot and start testing. Now, I promised you what a Java program would look like. This is a complete robot in Java. 
this is a drivable robot with four motor controllers. So we have right, left, uh, a right and left master and right and left follower. We've got them collected into speed controller groups so that you have a left drive, a left drive and a right drive. This is for a tank drive robot. So left and right motor controls are controlled via the joysticks. Um, we then do a, a differentiated, a different, excuse me, a differential drive. And we have an Xbox controller that we're using to drive this. This is an arcade drive. So it only uses one joystick. And uh, we just simply put it into tank drive mode here and we can then drive it around using an Xbox controller. So this is a complete version of the code. Um, and this is one of the um, uh, one of the example codes. So when you were back here doing the installation, uh, uh, creating the um, the project, you could do example Java arcade drive or tank drive depending on which versions come up and then it will automatically instantiate this code for you so you're ready to go and you've got something that's drivable this one uses pwm uh, pulse width modulation on the motor controllers if you wanted to use can bus then you'll have to make some changes to this but um, it turns out that rev and crossroad electronics have uh, GitHub repositories with example code for using their motor controllers. So you don't have to try and read through the documentation to figure this out. You can just simply go out to the Crossroad Electronics GitHub page or the Rev Robotics GitHub page, download the latest versions of the examples, and you'll have working examples for this year's code. All right, so we've got some resources that you should know about. Chief Delphi. If you have any questions about the software or the hardware or anything related to FIRST Robotics, chiefdelphi.com is the place to go. FIRST Forums, um, this is at the FIRST website. Uh, the FIRST Forums are useful for uh, getting game questions answered. If there's any issue with your National Instruments RoboRio, uh, National Instruments has a community forum. Uh, these sites are monitored by either WPI, National Instruments, or FIRST. And all of the source code is available typically for team-to-team -team assistance. Um, if you have any questions, of course, you can always reach out to National Instruments and give them a call. Um, most of the code that we have here, there's, there's no secrecy in this code. And that's because of gracious professionalism. As gracious professionalists, we are uh, helping our other teams, our fellow teams, come up to speed. We don't want any secrets here. Um, if you've got something really cool and you want to show it off, people are willing to take a look at it. Um, if people have questions, they're going to ask questions at places like Chief Delphi. Um, we do have online mentors uh, that can be set up for virtual mentoring. Uh, myself, if you're in the D.C. metro area, I can come out and take a look at what you've got and help you with things. Or you can come out to 116. We're out at Herndon High School. We'll be happy to help you out at 116 as well. And I know the folks uh, over at 1418, uh, Ve Victus, they have some excellent support as well. So absolutely reach out and take advantage of the resources that are available to you. So building and wiring the robot, challenging process. Um, fortunately, FIRST has got a lot of resources that are available to you. Use sensors if you can. If you take advantage of sensors, you can significantly improve the performance of your robot and reduce the amount of effort that your team, your drive team has to put into um, in order to drive the robot successfully. Um, programming environments, Java, C++, very similar. They use the same editor. Um, you can deploy code from within the editor. Uh, it's all pretty much automatic these days. They've really done a lot. Uh, there's not as much mystery uh, in programming first today as there used to be. Um, the only place where things still get a little squirrely is when you're trying to do stuff like swerve drive. Um, and that's because you've got eight motor controllers. You've got a sensor on each one of the drive systems. Uh, it gets really complicated for swerve drive. Fortunately, a lot of games don't require something as complicated as swerve drive, a simple tank drive, uh, a six wheel, you know, drop center uh, tank drive works great on a lot of robots. 
Um, but that's a discussion of drive systems and beyond scope for this particular presentation. So uh, I will open this up for questions. If there's anything uh, you have that I can answer right offhand, um, of course, Ve Victus uh, 1418 is making this presentation available at their website. Uh, um, we will also make uh, make the charts available to you, so you can download those as well. Um, and again, my email address is back up here uh, at uh, robotmaker12 at verizon.net. Uh, reach out to me. I'll be happy to try and point you in the right direction. Um, my response may be Google this, but nonetheless, uh, at least we'll get you on the right path. Oh, and uh, Stephen has just posted the uh, the link to the 1418 website, so uh, you can download that as well. Go out there, uh, get access to this. Uh, I'll transfer this uh, presentation over to Stephen so he can place it on the website as well. Thanks, right, Mike. So open it up for questions. Any questions? This is your chance to ask. I have, I have one. Yeah, go ahead. Um, for the RoboRio 3, is there any significance? Because uh, it's clearly it's a step up from RoboRio 2. So if we're able to get the 3, we can uh, or we should. Is there any other major um, like step ups for the four, besides the four chord center? Uh, not really. I mean, uh, I haven't seen all the details on the RoboRio 3 at this point. Uh, it will probably be a much more expensive unit because the device is much more expensive that's inside of it. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, nonetheless, it is pretty much the same. The interfaces are the same. The software is the same. Uh, you just need to make sure you get the right image loaded onto it through the RoboRio imaging tool. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Any, Any other, other questions? questions? Well, without questions, Mike, thank you for your presentation. And I can tell you from experience that Mike is willing to help other teams because he's visited a number of teams for me in the past. So thank you for that. Okay. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate Thanks, it. Thanks, Mike. See you soon, buddy. All righty. Bye-bye. Good luck with the season. You too.